Welcome everybody and congratulations on making it to chapter 26. We are into capital budgeting and investment analysis. So we're basically looking at whether or not we should buy equipment or how much a project is gonna cost us versus how much we'll make based on it. And does it supply us enough money to justify the tying up of money, okay? So that's pretty much what capital budgeting and investment analysis is on a very general scale. Of course, there's always exceptions and other things, but that's what I wanted to say there. Um, but before I begin, I wanted to bring up, and I know I should probably do this at the beginning of the semester instead at the end, but I just got a, a text from a former student and I'm trying to pull it up here. Um, the student is planning on coming back to school and um, said that um, well, they, they basically said they wanted to get their stuff together and get back to school and stuff like that. And one thing I told this individual was um, it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get to your destination, as long as you get to the destination. You have a goal, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it takes you five years, 20 years to get to your goal. It matters, just keep striving for that goal. My goal in life was to get a, a college degree, but, um, you know, I had some setbacks. I, I uh, was, was out of uh, school for a couple of years and then I came back in and then I went to, uh, uh, had to join joined up with the army and went to Iraq and you know it wasn't until I came back that I finished my college up and finished up some uh, some of my master's degrees and stuff went back to Iraq again and uh, just as I finished my first master no it was my second master no it was my first master's degree anyway got back and, and did a second master's so you know it, it doesn't matter how long it takes you so I mean it took me I think about 14 years to get my college degrees Whereas my peers were, you know, uh, maybe if they were to do the equivalent would have finished it in about uh, eight. Okay, so it took me twice as long, but it's okay. All right. So whatever your situation is, and, and like my student is, you know, oh, I, I, she says, I just need to come back. It doesn't matter if you had to take a break, if you're back, you're back. That's what's important. Keep striving for your goals and keep pressing forward. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some difficult different capital budgeting processes and why we do it. All right, we need to first know um, the reason for capital budgets, capital or capital projects. Capital projects are, are needed for uh, the use of equipment in our operations, um, or maybe we have this idea that we wanna do something and we're gonna look and see how much money it's gonna make us. These are the kinds of questions we have to ask ourselves and uh, figure out whether or not it's worth it for us to do it, or if we could find another safer, more normal way of investing ourselves you know, as a company. So uh, I'm not worrying about that process, these things you just saw there, you know, just, you know, there is a process, you can't just jump into something, but um, we have a lot of estimates again, okay? We don't know if our estimates are gonna be correct. We, um, once we make the decision, we may not be able to, to go back on it, okay? Because it might be kind of one of those all or nothing kind of things. Uh, usually when you purchase something or do something with the long-term investment in mind, it's gonna, it's gonna tie it up. And so uh, capital budgeting decisions are something that shouldn't be done lightly and there should be um, su su significant analysis to make sure that what you're doing is correct. Um, this is your your capital investment cash flows. There's, there's one thing that I don't like about this slide that doesn't include working capital, all right? Um, every project, everything you do requires some type of infusion of cash in order to keep it running, okay? Um, so you also have an initial investment or uh, the cash outflow at the, um, at the acquisition time um, as your uh, working capital that will be uh, released at the end of this uh, end of the project. So, all right, that's kind of just your little slide there. Let's start talking about the nitty gritty, uh, how to uh, account for these things. Okay, first method is the payback period. It's very simple. We take our initial investment and we divide it by our annual net cash flows. Um, 
if it's consistent in annual net cash flows, this is a very uh, clear cut way of doing it. It'll give us the number of years in which we get paid back. Managers want it shorter payback period because they want to be able to jump onto the next project. They don't want to be tied into something typically longer than a, maybe a couple to three or four years. Um, but this one's an easy calculation. Um, but with equal cash flows, you just take the total number of um, uh, your uh, your initial investment and divide it by your annual net cash flows, and you get in this example four years of a payback period. But I will tell you this: very seldom do you see a consistent amount of uh, return that is equal in every year. So looking at it from this standpoint of unequal cash flows, you just evaluate what year in which you get it paid back. And then you take that, um, and that, that monthly amount divided by, um, the net cat or take the, I'm sorry, you take the, um, remaining balance and divide it by the net cash flows. Um, and then you just add it to the number of years that was prior to that. So in this case, it was four years. You have $2,000 left to make up. If you take the 2,000 divided by the cash flows, that's 0.5. In this situation, it's gonna be uh, four and a half years that you're gonna get paid back. Um, this, this method sucks, okay? Um, because it doesn't account for uh, time value of money. And um, it does, they don't care about what you're making afterwards. So. It's easy. You saw how easy it was to compute, um, and uh, it does take into account the cash flows, but it's it's very weak. It's not very strong. And I, and when I've been dealing with uh, these types of things, um, I've never ever dealt with the payback period. So uh, the next one is the accounting rate of return, uh, and and again, the accounting rate of return is your annual income and divided by your average investment. Okay. So if, oh, sorry, average investment is you're gonna take your initial investment plus the salvage value and divide it by two. This is interesting because you're adding the salvage value instead of subtracting it in this one. So please make sure you focus on that. We're not calculating the straight line, we're calculating the average investment. So initial investment plus salvage value divided by two gets you your average investment. And then you take your annual income divided by the average investment and that's your accounting rate of return. And the reason for why, well, let's just leave it at that. I don't want to get you guys confused. Um, and then the decision is to take the one with the highest uh, accounting rate of return. But again, accounting rate of return uh, ignores the time value of money and does not consider cash flows. So that one's pretty weak. Now we have the net present value. Net present value is something I have dealt with. Um, now, I won't say regularly, but I, there was a job I had for a good while there where we did calculate our net present value of, um, of a company. And um, it, 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 this one's more, more powerful than the other two, I think for obvious reasons, and you'll see why here. Um, this is the company's required rate of return. It's called the hurdle rate. What this means is that a company believes uh, that it can make a certain require a certain rate of almost um, what am I looking for um, non risk safe money safe investments or basically they know they can get if they just invested money in the stock market they could get a certain rate of return so they're going to make a certain rate of return it's a company established amount or percent that if a, if a project doesn't meet that, they're not investing it and they don't care, okay? So this is something that we need to uh, consider and um, when making its decisions. So, so in this case, um, the company's required annual return is 9%. It's considering a $20,000 investment in a machine that expected to provide $10,000 of annual net cash flows. So if you're not familiar with net present value, there are these factors that you can glean from the back of the table. Um, I'll probably do a snippet video on how to do that. So if you see one of those and you have questions on that, then please feel free to, re to review those. Um, but we're taking these um, present values from these tables and we're calculating it here. And what we're doing is we're gonna find out what the total net present cash flow is. The, the idea is, is that a uh, dollar today is worth less than a dollar or is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. So if we're putting out $20,000 today, 
we got to discount the amount of what that cash actually represents. Okay. And that's going to be over here. Um, so $10,000 today is, is 9,174 in a year, this much in two years and this much in three years, adding those together. And we see that this project will bring in a $5,313 net present value. We take this, these factors from uh, the end period, number of periods is one for this one, but all of them are 9%. And then this is periods two, this is period three, okay? That's what we're doing with these. An easier way, since these are, are, are um, consistent cash flows, would be to just take this 10,000 and then take the present value of an annuity factor and do it just the multiplication one time, it'll get you that same number. And yeah, the decision rule is if the net present value is greater than zero, then we would invest in it. Here's the, you know, the little decision thing here. Uh, if the present value minus the initial investment equals the present net present value, if it's greater than zero, we're investing. If it's less than zero, we don't invest. If it's less than zero, then we are going to have, we should be able to have something more later on down the road or something that we can put into that'll give us better. So this is talking about the annuity assumption. If they were equal years, we don't need to go to each one of those uh, lump sums, uh, basically table B2, I think it was, or B1, whatever it was. Uh, we're going to take them from the net pre the um, present value. Annuity. Now we have a different situation, okay, completely. So what we're doing here is we need a company that has 10% uh, is our discount rate. So we're going to look for 10% here, and we're going to look for the annuity. It says that we're going to consider investing 800000 It's going to give us $15,000 per year for 10 years. So we're going to go down and find the row that says 10 years, our end value is going to be 10000 or excuse me, um, 10 years, and then we're gonna look for 10% on our column. And that factor is gonna be that 6.1446. We're gonna take 15,000 and multiply it by that, give us 92,169, subtract out our initial investment, our net present value is 12,169. Listen, it's not always gonna be where it's, it's a positive. You're gonna have ones that are negative. And if it's a negative, the entrepreneur is gonna to try to find a way to make that to where it is positive. What do we need to do? Is 10% realistic in our current market situation? Perhaps it should be 8%. If we reduce that, then maybe we could actually make this product work or project work. Um, is, is it that we are um, doing something different? Can we change some costs around? Can we do something different to make this work? That's what an entrepreneur wants to do is not necessarily say, oh, darn it, we can't do this project. Sorry, no. How can we make this project work? What is it that we need to do to make this project work? Okay, if we have unequal cash flows, then we may need to take each one of these dollar amounts um, at this different, at these um, net present value of ones. So in, if, if project A is, is the same, great. But if project B, and we're comparing them both, is gonna be 8,000, then 5,000, then 2,000, we're gonna need to take these um, present value of a lump sum instead of the annuity ones. So, um, and again, you should be familiar with these present value concepts. You should have learned them in high school. Uh, I'm guessing you should have had a math class by now where it's taught you this. If you haven't, I will do some snippet videos now that I think about it so that just watch those. In fact, you can even pause this video now. Go watch my snippets on the um, net present value and, and then come back and watch these. So, um, so anyway, we discount the both of them at these dollar amounts, add them all together. Which one's the better one? Which one's the higher amount? As long as they're both above zero, if we have unlimited funds, we're gonna take them both. But if we don't have a, a unlimited funds, we're gonna take the one that gives us the highest return. In this case, it's gonna be project B. It's gonna give us $908. And the reason why it's gave us $900 more than this is because um, it's giving us more money earlier. So those are stronger dollars than the later years. Um, net present value minus investments with salvage value. Okay, now we got to factor in salvage value when we're doing this. So here we have the same situation here, um, the fifteen thousand dollars over the ten years. But now we have salvage value at year ten. We gotta we gotta factor that in because we're gonna sell it for what we expect to be ten thousand dollars in year ten. Now that ten thousand dollars in year ten is actually gonna be worth three thousand eight hundred fifty-five dollars in today's dollars. So we're gonna add that to the project, and it's gonna just increase our net present value. So, but it is one we have to factor in. Um, and, and if you're doing this, they're not factoring in working capital. 
if you do factor working capital in, you're going to have that added as part of the initial investment, or at least as a second item here listed as working capital. But you're also going to have in year 10 working capital that's released back to the company. And let's say it was another $10,000. So you'll have two items listed here, one for salvage value and one for um, uh, release of, of uh, working capital that'll both be listed here and just add to that. But you'll have an initial reduction of $10,000. Uh, that'll increase this initial investment because that cash flow or that um, working capital is going to be tied up for that full 10 years. Pairing that present value projects, the profitability index, um, you know, you want to usually again go with the higher one here. So project two would probably be what you'd want uh, being at 1.5. Present value of the net cash flow is divided by your initial investment. Um, profitability index of less than one indicates a negative net present value. So project three is out completely. Um, project one and two would be viable if with unlimited resources, but without unlimited resources, we stick to number two because it's got the higher one. So, uh, but again, if you have $2 million to throw around, take them both. They're both profitable. Uh, computing internal rate of return and explain its use. Okay. So our internal invest, our initial investment divided by our annual net cash flows is going to give us our present value factor. Um, and then um, we need to identify our discount rate. So um, what we do is we take our initial investment divided by our annual net cash flows. We come up with the amount here and we come into our, our, our uh, time value of money tables and look for that number. And when we find it or the one that's the closest to it, we go and we we tap into that. That's the one. That's how we do it. It's just basically looking it up uh, in the charts, and and I'll try and go over that in the um, in the snippet videos as well. Um, if your internal rate of return is greater than the hurdle rate, then you invest. If it's lower than it, you don't invest. Same as kind of what we've been talking about. I would print this slide off. Okay, I would print this slide off. This basically sums everything up we've talked about. At least the important stuff. I would want to know this information. I would want to have that available to you. Okay. Um, th this is the end of the chapter. So I'm going to give you your word. Now the word is float F L O A T Foxtrot Lima Oscar alpha tango float F O F L O A T. I like to float on the water. Look at the, uh, Rose bowl parade float. Uh, I love an A and W root beer float float is the word. Okay. Um, this is it guys. You guys made it all the way through chapter 26. This is the end of the, of the, oh, whoa. Um, that should have been hidden. I apologize. We are not going to do that. So, um, this is the end of the semester. The last thing you're going to have is the project due for the, um, capital budgeting project. So please make sure if you have any questions, this chapter should help you get there. All right. Um, if you have any questions, though, let me know, but make sure you focus and read on the, on the, um, instructions first and that you cover all that. All right. You guys have a good one. We'll see you guys later and, uh, good luck to you. Um, if you're continuing on with accounting, I wish you the very best. If you're not continuing on with counting, why not? <laughs> just kidding. Um, not really, but just kidding either way. I, I wish you two the very best of luck as well. If you're going into some other, um, uh, degree, but um, just remember accounting is strong and and uh, will definitely get you a, a job and, and everything else. We're, we're, all, we're high in demand always. We've never not been. Okay. So anyway, take care. We'll see you guys. Uh, see you guys around. Bye.